Hello. Welcome. Thank you for being with us here today at Penobscot Marine Museum. Please leave your questions and comments below. We love hearing from you. This is Arvillon's watercolor painting of the investigator. It's a bark built in Searsport in 1856 by John Carver, owned by Searsport Sea Captains, including Phineas Pendleton, John Carver, Isaac Carver. The last record of the investigator is from 1864, but I wasn't able to find out what happened to the ship after that. When ships passed each other out in the ocean, they would converse with each other via signal flags, checking each other's navigational estimates and sharing any other important information or news. And when a ship returned to port, they would report all the ships that they had spoke, as they called it, or encountered and were able to talk to each other. In the time before onboard radios, these reports from other vessels might be the only way to track the progress and well-being of a ship at sea. On Friday, February 26, 1864, the New York Times reported in a long list of other ships that the investigator had been seen off Cape Florida, off of Miami. Imagine living in a time without radios or cell phones and searching the newspaper for mention of the ship that say your son is on, going for weeks, sometimes months without any notice or letter. This is a lovely sort of gentle watercolor with very precise drawing of the ship. People working on board. A really interesting small sailing vessel back here with tall, long rectangular sails. And the lighthouse over here is just sitting on a rock. This is the Cordouan Lighthouse located at the mouth of the Gironde Estuary. It is the oldest lighthouse in France still in use. Building of the lighthouse commenced in 1584, but there have been beacons there going back to 1880. So for comparison, at the time that the Viking armies were landing in England and establishing settlements, there was a beacon on this rock keeping ships safe from crashing into I had not heard of the Gironde estuary before, and I wondered why ships might have traveled there. And when I looked on the map, I found my answer. This is a map of the Mediterranean, and we're going to look over on the Atlantic coast of France. They're calling it on this map the River Gironde, and we can see it goes down in here to Bordeaux. Aha, that's why they're going in there. French wine making goes back to at least 500 BCE and 800 years later in the year 350, Ausonius, a Roman poet from Bordeaux, writes about the wine production there. In medieval times, Eleanor of Aquitaine, one of the most powerful women in medieval Europe, at that time, he owned uh, the region which included Bordeaux. After deciding that she didn't want to be Queen of France anymore, she had her marriage to Louis VII annulled and married Henry Plantagenet. Two years later, she was Queen of England, and Bordeaux wine was shipped to England, the Netherlands, and other politically related areas. She was a pretty amazing woman. We know that she led troops into battle, but most of her power and influence came from her good understanding of diplomacy and court. Bordeaux remains a major wine producer even today, 
with 280,000 acres of wine, grapes, and cultivation, and shipping millions of cases of wine a year around the world. I love uh, this notation here on the map. Watch out for the sand and mud over there. You can see the artist's title at the bottom of this painting. Admus of New York, Captain Whitlock, 1822. Marquis de Lafayette rode on the Cadmus when he made a return visit to the United States in 1824. President James Monroe had invited Lafayette to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the United States. Decades earlier, during the Revolutionary War, Lafayette had volunteered for the colonial forces, believing that the revolution was a noble cause. So for instance, if you've seen the show Hamilton, you may remember him as one of the characters. Lafayette performed well for the colonial forces and reached the rank of Major General before he turned 20. Later in life, he served France in several elected positions and argued for religious tolerance and abolition. Like many people in favor of democracy, he was disgusted when Napoleon Bonaparte declared himself emperor and Lafayette removed himself from political life. Even decades later, many Americans still have great respect for Lafayette. For example, the owner of the Cadmus told the captain to send his freight and passengers in another ship and give Cadmus entirely over to Lafayette and his party when he was traveling to the US at President Monroe's invitation. The Cadmus was 97 feet and built in New York in 1818. It sailed to the Mediterranean, becoming part of the second packet ship line to Le Havre, France in 1822 and served until 1828. After that, the ship sailed out of Philadelphia for a few years and later was used as a whaler. Coincidentally, the Cadmus, the vessel wrecked on Cadmus, the island, now part of French Polynesia, an uninhabited atoll in the Tuamotu archipelago. On the map, it looks like just this tiny little speck in the vast Pacific Ocean. In 1842, the Cadmus wrecked. Captain Edwin L. Mayhew, his first mate and four seamen, ended up sailing 13 days in an open whale boat to Tahiti, which also reminds me of the story of the guys on the Essex whale boats who were lost in the Pacific Ocean. They could have gone to Tahiti, but were very afraid of cannibals um, in the 19th century. And so they didn't head that way. Instead, they took uh, the longer, more dangerous route. Um, and several of the men died. For a whole different gripping story of shipwrecked men lost and floating in a small boat, be sure to register for stories from the Spirit of Seagoers, October 29th at 6 p.m. Thank you again so much for joining us today at Penobscot Marine Museum. Please put your questions and comments below. One last thing about this painting is this stone wall is, you can see people on it. And from the other point of view, there's, it's this long promenade. Monet painted a painting of it from other side, from the town side. And it shows lots of people walking up and down. This is a watercolor uh, by Joseph Honoré Maxime Pellegrin, who worked out of Marseille. The artist lived from 1763 to 1869. I wasn't able to find a lot of information about these French artists, so I was sad about that. The Alberta, a bark built in Stockton, Maine in 1854 was captained by William Hitchborn. And we see her leaving Marseille in this image in 1855. You can see the very old port buildings here. It looks odd with the water seemingly coming up on either side. It's because this 
sticks out. These stone fortifications stick out into the water, so the water is flowing behind them. Um, that white that he left there makes it pop out and makes it a little bit confusing. Greek settlers in 1600 BC built a trading post here, and that was the beginning of Marseille being a thriving port town for hundreds and hundreds of years. Margaret Oakes was 14 in 1880 when she sailed with her father on the barkentine Mary Genis. They were from Brewer, Maine. They first sailed to Marseille, France, where they stayed in port for two months. They left France early in 1881, sailing to Havana, Cuba, and then to New York. Margaret writes about Marseille in her journal, and I'm going to read you just a couple of little excerpts from her writing. Marseille is a very old city as it was founded in 539 BC. The old part of the city where we discharge our oil is mean and dirty, but the principal part of the city is quite nice, especially Canabier, which has many nice places on it. There are many nice cafes on the streets. The Chambre de Commerce is on this street and is quite a nice building. Opposite, there is a public garden with seats for anyone to sit down. Marseille has two harbors. One of these is called Vieux Port, Old Port, which is the one that we see in this picture here. None of the vessels lay alongside the wharf, but all lay at anchor, excepting the foot of Canabier, where there is room for five vessels. We were fortunate enough to get one of these berths to load our tiles. The other harbor is surrounded by a long breakwater on one side, and the vessels go there alongside the quay to discharge and load. There are some very large warehouses on these quays. When we first arrived in Marseille, there were four American vessels there and we had very nice times. One captain had his wife and we visited back and forth a good deal. One afternoon, we all went to some gardens on Canabier. They were very nice. Every animal and bird that you could think of were there. There was one house a purpose for monkeys, every variety that you could think of. Before we went to the cathedral, we went to our ship's chandlers and he invited us to go to the Chateau d'If the next day. Sunday morning, we all went aboard of Captain Hines in the brig Don Wesley and started from there. He laid at the foot of Canabier, so it was very handy. The entrance to the harbor is between a fort called San Juan and a castle that the Empress Eugenia erected, though she's never lived in it. It's very large. In the streets of Marseille, you see many priests and nuns and a great many soldiers. We made the acquaintance of two St. John's captains and also one Nova Scotia captain who had his wife with him. We went to the theater six times in Marseille the Follies three times, Crystal Palace once. They were not very interesting except the acrobatic performances and pantomimes as all the rest was singing in French. We were in Marseille two months in all, discharging oil and loading tiles. One afternoon, we went up to see the art gallery and museum. The art gallery was very large and had some large, beautiful oil paintings. There were several artists there copying the oil. The museum also was very large and had many skeletons and stuffed animals and birds in it. Also every kind of shell. There were some very beautiful cafes on Canabier. The best one is called Café Glacé. I liked Marseille very much. Tini, next week, by request, William Pierce Stubb. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our members and donors. This programming has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Take care.